Scott, in trying to understand quantum theory, how can computation help? Ah, so I think that computation uh, actually contributes uh, a lot of insights into uh, back into physics, you know, including certainly into quantum theory, which is our basis for almost all of physics since the, the 1920s. Uh, so, um, you know, one, one way is uh, through quantum computation. And I think that a uh, 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 theory of, of quantum computers, which are these, you know, uh, hypothetical machines, you know, we've only built very small ones so far, but uh, we hope to build much bigger ones in the future. That Actually, the theory of these machines, you know, in some sense, all of it is just operating within quantum mechanics as that theory has existed for 80 years, right? So it's not changing the theory. But what it's doing is it's forcing us to ask a whole new set of questions about the theory. Okay, so, you know, what, what kind of computations can you do with it, right? Uh, you know, and it's, and it's sort of forcing attention onto whole new aspects of it that are very different than what, say, Bohr and Heisenberg in the 1920s, you know, thought were the central things, right? They thought that, you know, the, uncert the, big, the biggest thing was the uncertainty principle. Actually, I think from a modern perspective, the biggest thing is that uh, you need this exponential amount of information to uh, just to write down the state of a small number of particles. So if you had, say, uh, uh, a thousand atoms, then you might need a, a, a two to a thousand power numbers just to record what these atoms are doing. Okay, and that's that's the central fact that a quantum computer would try to uh, 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 exploit, take advantage of, and uh, I think it you know raises all sorts of conceptual issues just for for, for physics. Okay, now, um, you know... Because that's the important point, is how yeah. do we get to the physics? We know yeah. f from that how we can understand the technology of computing and the problems and the yes. issues, but right. I'm, we're now looking the other direction. Mm -hmm. What yes. can that help us to understand okay. about the fundamental aspects of the physics? Good. So, so, so one uh, direction there that I've been uh, particularly interested in is uh, uh, the limits of computation, and can we use those to derive new you know, insights or hypotheses about physics, okay? So, you know, th there are certain um, things that if they were true about the physical world, they would mean that we could perform astronomically hard computations almost for free. Okay, you know, much, much more, even, you know, a quantum computer would be puny by comparison to what we could do. So, to take one example, suppose that you had a computer that could do the first step of its operation in one second, and then the second step in half a second, the third step in a quarter second, fourth step in an eighth of a second, and so on. Okay, each st step half the time of the previous one. And within two seconds, it would have done infinitely many steps. You could call this Zeno's computer, right? Um, okay, now, you know, so, you know, uh, why don't we see this? You know, it sounds great, right? Well, actually, people do try to, you know, overclock, as it's called, their chips. They try to run their microchips faster. The danger is if you run it too fast, then your microprocessor will actually melt. Okay, and so in order to run it faster, you need more and more energy. You need more and more powerful cooling system. Okay, and so supercomputers today are often just consist of thousands of, uh, say, you know, standard, say, Pentium chips, but which are cooled by liquid nitrogen close to absolute zero, so that they can be quickly run faster. Okay, so, uh, safely run faster. Now the problem is, if you wanted to, you know, run your chip faster and faster and faster, you would need more and more cooling, bigger and bigger refrigerators, more and more energy, and until if you really wanted to run your computer, let's say, it, um, um, uh, faster than one uh, operation per Planck time, a Planck time is about 10 to the minus 43 seconds, okay, and um, unimaginably small amount of time, okay, but, you know, we, we, we know how small it is, okay, if you try to run your computer at that speed, then you would actually need so much energy that you would exceed what's called the Bekenstein bound, which would actually uh, means that your computer, you know, and everything around it would collapse to a black hole. Okay, so I love this. This is sort of nature's way of telling you that you can't do something, right? Uh, um, so that helps us understand yeah. the fundamental physics. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I mean, you know, another example people like to give is the relativity computer, cousin of the quantum computer, right? So this would be a computer that you know you started off running on some astronomically hard computation, then you leave it on Earth, 
You board a spaceship traveling at close to the speed of light. You fly around. You come back to Earth. Now, Einstein tells us that, you know, in Earth's frame of reference, billions of years have passed. All your friends are long dead. Civilization may but have the collapsed. the computer's running. But you've got the answer to your computational <laughs> problem, right? Now, you know, you, you can ask, okay, why can't you do this, right? Well, again, you know, the problem seems to be the amount of energy that you would need to accelerate to that close to the speed of light. Okay, so you're, again, pay, if you want an exponential speed up, you're going to pay an exponential price in the energy that you need to accelerate. So the universe has this kind of built-in balance of harmony that exactly. is not, not allowing you to do that's it. That's certainly what it looks like. That's exactly what it looks like, that you've got to pay the exponential price one place or another if you want this exponential speed, computational speed up. Okay, now to me, this suggests that we could go a step further, and uh, we could actually, if we chose to, you know, enshrine the fact that certain computational problems are hard in the physical world as a principle right put it put a box around it right and so it would be akin to say the second law of thermodynamics or the impossibility of faster than light communication right physicists will often make the argument well such and such can't happen because if it did happen then it would lead to faster than light communication right and so i think similarly you could say and to some extent people already are saying things like such and such and such can't happen physically because if it did happen then you could solve these astronomically hard computational problems okay and so you could use it you could use the assumed hardness of certain computational problems to explain for example why you know uh, time seems to become discrete at this Planck scale of 10 to the minus 43 seconds because otherwise you could do these astronomically hard computations okay why do closed time like curves not exist well because if they did exist you could use them to solve these astronomically hard problems and because you can't it puts a limitation on what is true about the physical world exactly it, it, it sort of constrains our search for physical theories